Hi there, everyone. How is everyone today? It is It is a pretty nice day here in Toronto. It uh, has been raining, then we had some sunshine, now we're back to rain. Um, I'm actually just going to change my glasses because I've got a lot of blue reflection coming off them here. Let's just change here. Uh, not much better. <laughs> it's, it's better in one way and a little bit re more reflective in another, but let's go with it. Well, welcome everyone. I see, as usual, you are just coming from everywhere in the world. We got Kentucky, we've got Bristol in the UK, Northern California. Hello, Nancy. Missed you the other night at Karen's Quilt Crew. I'm sure you were busy with some important family things. Oh, Illinois, Antonio, Texas, Teresa, <laughs> John from Art East. I hope you saw my unicorn today on Instagram. <laughs> Louisiana, North Bay, that's just north of here. We call North Bay the near north in Ontario. Kay from Alabama, Joyce from Indiana, from Florida. Yes, all sorts of wonderful, wonderful places in the world. Sutherland, is that Maryland? Yorkshire. Oh, a lot of people. I'm not sure if my British people received this quilt. I know it's the same as last last month's, but these are my London uh, motifs. And a lot of it says, pop in to see the Queen from London with love. See the sights. Just for the Queen's Jubilee. I'm not sure if anybody else noticed while well, the Queen's Jubilee was on that how much textiles were a part of the Jubilee. I don't think there could have been any celebration without them. They were in the tapestries, they were in the uniforms, they were in the clothing that uh, the queen was wearing and uh, the guests showed up in and just all over. It was just fascinating how much textiles were part of that. And I realize, you know, that's part of what royalty is, is all that brightness and color. But good for the Queen, Platinum Jubilee, holy mackerel. So I am just going to start today, and I am going to start with a question from Tracy Floria. She was one of the wonderful ladies that came on the Alaskan cruise with me. And uh, she is asked, she would like to make a memory quilt from the trip with some of the fabrics that she purchased not necessarily full size, where does she start? Suggestions on the block and the design. Well, we picked up a lot of wonderful fabrics on the trip and that is actually what my video of this week is going to be about, is going to recap our trip and talk about the fabric haul <laughs> from the various quilt stores. And with any fabric, I think you just need to sit down and start looking at the shapes and the colors in the, in the fabric and find that optimum size where the colors work well. Um, where, like, is it a four inch block? Is it a 10 inch block? Is it a two inch block? Now, most of the blocks that we, um, the fabrics that we purchased had big patterns in them. And most of what I purchased had almost like a panel in it. So go from there um, and then just take a look at some star blocks or things like that. And um, I would that would be the starting point. There's no one answer that fits everything, but I would always start with just playing with squares. Um, I gave you four pieces in that um, symmetry class and just try and block it out what will be the best size for it each and then find colors that are higher and lower value to go with it and then try and tell a story with it. Now one thing that I didn't realize was the Big Dipper is on the Alaskan state flag so you could make star blocks and then turn that into a Big Dipper and call that your Alaskan your Alaskan quilt. So lots of lots of ideas. They were Lots of different things you could go with. And then, of course, some of the stores had uh, quilt patterns um, that they showed how to use those fabrics, too. So always 
go back to their websites and take a look at the 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 quilts that they've already previously made yeah uh people are asking how was the cruise cruise was absolutely fantastic it was lovely uh there were 36 of us plus 36 in total just a wonderful group of people um there were seven husbands on board plus our two cruise guys uh ray and john and celebrity the boat was wonderful the food was wonderful the service was wonderful um, our cabin was comfortable um, i would sit out on my balcony in the morning and i could hear the way the whales breathing and then i would find them and uh, just lovely and we we didn't have good weather um, for the first couple of days but we didn't need it we had perfect weather when it was time to see the hubbard glacier when it was time to go up the train in Skagway and when it was time to go to Denali and see Denali. Um, once we got off the boat in Anchorage, we sort of had a run for our money. The, the cruise, um, the land tour portion was not very well organized and extremely rushed. And we were all very discombobulated getting off the boat and suddenly being on a bus for five hours straight. Um, but the tour of the National Park was great, and I would definitely do it again. And I am so happy with the people that I met. Um, Tracy, uh, just wonderful person. I hope to meet, <laughs> chat with her online. I hope to uh, maybe meet up with her during the year. We just, I've formed some really nice friendships with these people. Taught my symmetry class and my color class, and if my all goes well I'm going to have those online for September 1st that's what I'm aiming for Labor Day so um, all in all it was a great trip but I did come home with COVID and my both my husband and I had it uh, we tested positive the very first day we got home so we must have been traveling with it in uh, on that land tour that's probably one reason why we weren't comfortable um, and though the we didn't have terrible, like we didn't have, we didn't have it in our chest. We didn't have um, massive headaches um, or terrible pain or fever. Um, it has lingered and I'm finding my, my brain can only do so much a day before it really gets tired. So there is this lingering fog uh, to it. But I must admit today I'm feeling much, much better. Um, so keeping my fingers crossed that it's going to be gone. Um, and, uh, looking forward to the next cruise. <laughs> so that's the long answer. <laughs> that's the long answer, but I apologize. I was going to vlog, um, from the ship, uh, but it turns out there's no signal in Alaska and, uh, just could not upload a darn thing. And, uh, it was getting so stressful that I decided, you know what, I'm just going to enjoy my cruise and then I'll do it when I get home. And um, I now just have the brain power to get it all together. So I'm hoping to have that ready for this weekend. Just the summary of what we did and uh, what fabrics I bought. So stay tuned. Um, I think I've answered, uh, somebody has asked, will we see any videos of the cruise? Well, next week you will. Barbara Breckman has asked, um, her sister is coming, uh, to be with her this summer and wants, uh, her to teach her to quilt. Um, so she'd like to do a project with her. What would be a good beginner project that we could get done in a couple of days? Well, take a look at Stash Buster number one or, uh, Stash Buster number five, which is the ugly quilt pattern. Um, both of them are fast, simple, um, and very forgiving, very forgiving. And you can make a good lap size quilt in a couple of days from start to finish and do a nice, simple wavy line pattern over it, uh, to quilt it. Um, and it'll be fun. It'll be fun and you can use ugly fabric or you can use your good fabric. They're basically both the same technique. Uh, stash buster number one, the cuts are perpendicular. In stash buster number five, 
the cuts are on an angle. So, um, but both of them are random and both of them are a lot of fun. So, uh, Anna Palmer asks, any new pattern videos coming out soon? I have one that's on the shelf ready to do. Um, I just need the time. It really comes down to time. So hopefully it'll get in the docket um, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Sam Smith has asked, do I have any tips for making bunting with scraps? Now, if you don't know what bunting is, bunting is those like pendants and they come in all sorts of different shapes and they, you string them along. At least that's what I know bunting as. Um, and I actually showed a set of Halloween ones that I made in my last video. Um, just a smaller project, good for the summertime, good for using up scraps. So I'm not quite sure what tips you're looking for. Um, I use up my scrap binding on them. Uh, those ones were Halloween ones. They were made from a, a, a panel actually. So they were sort of predetermined, but scraps, what would you do with like make scrappy ones, uh, to say happy birthday or something like that. Um, with any scraps, just know that there's going to be a lot of threads. <laughs> so you just have to mine those. So maybe you could just explain more what the issue with scraps and bunting would be. Um, Amanda Morrissey has asked for some tips on keeping seams lined up when the seam allowances go against the feed dogs. So I understand what she's saying. You know when we have seams and then we're sewing those seams with seams <laughs> at perpendicular to them. As your presser foot is going through the machine, suddenly you encounter this ridge and sometimes the, the seam is facing you and sometimes it's facing away. And of course, with your feed dogs, if they're, com if they're facing towards you, it's a lot easier for those feed dogs to c come over. Personally, I like it so much better when the seam is pointing away from me because the seams underneath are pointing towards me and I find it locks in a lot better. The biggest thing to remember is there's no shame in stopping. You don't have to sew right over it. Um, if they are HSTs or things like that, you, your whole work can get twisted. So take a moment, slow down, um, use a stiletto to help keep them flat. But the biggest thing that I use is a high header. Let me just see if I got a piece of scrap fabric here, small piece here. So I would just take a scrap piece of fabric and I would fold it and then fold it again. Sometimes you may even fold it again and just stick that under your pressure foot and that gives it a little bit of lift. So it's not digging in and trying to get up and over those seams. It's just sliding along and that will keep them much straighter. I was personally using this technique a lot in the last two days. I was making my trending unicorn block and there's a many places where there's lots of seams that come together. And to keep them straight, you just need to lift that presser foot up a little bit higher. And I just do that with a little piece of fabric and I just tuck it underneath my foot. But you'll find that that will really help. And stop. <laughs> you can take it one stitch at a time. There's no need to rush over those intersections. Yeah. And Aiden Stockdale has asked, what is my experience with facings instead of bindings? Any tips? Well, facing is when you don't bind. You're actually using the fabric and you're folding it over the batting and then you're, um, you're hand sewing it together along the back. So to me, the most important thing is that the fabric that's coming over the top to the back is actually longer than the fabric on the back. So, um, you're folding that fabric over on the back, at maybe at a quarter of an inch. So it's just hitting the edge of your, your batting. The one that's coming over at the top has to be just a little bit longer to tuck in underneath. So, cause you don't want that back fabric showing along the edge. So that's my experience with facing. 
Um, I also have to be mindful when I'm quilting that I don't quilt too close to that edge so I still have the mobility of my fabrics. Yeah. Freestyle quilts. Now freestyle quilts, if you don't know her, she is a prolific <laughs> quilter online and she has beautiful photography in her Instagram feed. She's asking, what is my typical schedule like and how do you manage your time between filming, quilting, and the in-between task of getting ready, cleaning, decluttering, and organizing? Well, there's many times when I'm trying to multitask. So um, while I'm cleaning, I'm thinking of scripts. Uh, as I'm walking the dog, I'm thinking of scripts. Um, and what are the next projects and planning my day and getting things in order? Um, but it's busy. Um, I think, I think there at some point you have to realize that you can't get it all done. There's always something that's falling off the edge. Um, and you just have to edit your life, um, in such a way that you just keep the things that are most important. One, you keep, um, you know, there's so many different tasks out there. There's so many different opportunities out there that you've got to be very choosy about what you do and is it going to make your life better. It can be exciting um, or some things are just, oh, well, I can do that. And you just have to stop, think and realize, is this really going to help my aims and goals? So, um, you know, I get, I get uh, different people asking, to sponsor my videos and I'll often say no I don't want that one there's no value within the within my video for that and in my there's no value to my audience either um, and there's no reason to get distracted um, I think somebody's asking me if I'm teaching down south and things like that and I cannot run a YouTube channel and be taking three days out of every week to go teach a class somewhere. Like it, the, the two things don't work together. So you've got to be able to edit that way. Um, but not everything is about the channel and money. You know, I, I've had to make a priority for my family. So if suddenly they show up at the door and they're wanting to play Catan tonight or uh, learn a new board game or just be together for an hour or two, I've got to realize, okay, that's the priority. I've got to put that aside and maybe my video will launch a day late because I've taken that time. So um, it's all a juggle, but um, editing, uh, decluttering is editing and keep it, trying to keep as much clutter out of your life as possible is also really important because everything begats a question with it, right? Do I need it? When am I going to use it? And there's so many times that you just have to realize you're never going to make all the quilts in the world. <laughs> so you got to be very choosy about what time, which ones you, you put all your energy towards. So that's my long answer. <laughs> Can Aussie mum uh, has asked, what kind of quilt design would you use on a great granny square block? Now, I actually have pulled up a photo or two here just to show you what a granny square, this is a granny square block quilt. And there's actually a free pattern on how to make this if you want. I found one from Robert Kaufman and maybe Brandy could put that in the notes if anybody's interested. But the blocks actually look like, let me just turn on, the blocks up close, this is what they look like. Now you, there's also versions that are a little bit, there's more blocks in this, but this is the basic idea. Um, so you have a, a center block and then you have four squares and then you have nine squares. And you can contrast those, um, you can put the darker ones on the outside and then the medium ones and then a focus like you can fussy cut that uh, center block if you want or you can do it the opposite way or you can do as this is these are blocks by wombat quilts she was I pulled this off of the internet today 
and she has chosen to do the five in the middle one color and then the five on the outside another color she's not necessarily um, changing the value she's just changing the color so how do you quilt that quilt then how do you quilt a quilt made out of these um, the block is it, they come together very scrappy so depending on how you have chosen to put them together what is it that you want to emphasize are you wanting to emphasize that block in the middle of all those the square that's in the middle of all those blocks or if it if it looks similar to this one right here I would just do a pantograph or because everything's on point I would just do straight line quilting through it um, the one thing you need to consider when you're choosing your design is you want all your pieces to be secured with quilting so a pantograph can do that straight line quilting can do that alternatively you could also do a similar pattern within each block so do a circular uh, feather um, or do a geometric um, point to point but in the end you've got to think about what is it that you want to emphasize and just go with that one yeah there <laughs> uh cat ashley ashby has asked do i have any tips on getting through a pattern that you can't understand not all patterns are well written or some patterns are just written in a way that they they just don't mesh with the way your brain works. So I'll be honest, I often don't even look at the pattern. <laughs> John from Art East is here. Um, I look at his diagrams, but I, I actually have not read the instructions and that's probably why a couple of times I've put the wrong block in the wrong place. But um, I am very visual and I can figure out the math so between those two things i often am not reading the pattern um, i may re i try to read it from front to back right at the very beginning so i can kind of see where there's going to be some issues but i normally change the way you cut the fabric i normally um, make sure that i have an ironing plan like i i t do a practice block and i i make sure i understand how it needs to be ironed uh, those are things that are important to me. Um, so how do you work through a pattern that you, ca you can't understand? You have to pull out the pieces that you do. You have to, um, it, as long as you understand it enough that it's a, like you could actually make it. If it's trying to teach you a new technique, I would actually go to YouTube and just see if there's something somebody else that could illustrate that technique for you um, but if it's just a matter of math and how the things go together you might be able to figure that out yourself um, alternatively you can talk to a friend talk to a quilting friend because there's different as I say different brains work different ways and they may understand what you don't understand um, and there's definitely been patterns that way where I have not understand a thing and a friend has said this is the most brilliant pattern I've ever seen <laughs> so it's just, it truly is just the way brains are working so ask a friend if it's about a technique I would look on YouTube um, and just pull out the parts of it that you can do and then just um, then be in discussions with people for those parts that you don't and realize that there are mistakes that are often made in patterns so um, most pattern designers have a section on their website called errata errata um, and go check there um, and that's normally where they put the corrections and some designers have a lot more than others so uh, you may yeah if you can't figure it out because the math's not working it might be an actual mistake in the pattern 
Donald Stevenson has asked, or sorry, Donald Stevens has asked, have I ever made stuff to sew and sell? If so, what is the best way to market your items and business? So, no, I have, well, not for a long time. When I was a, a teenager, I would make stuffed animals and sell them. Um, but I, uh, it's, it's hard to do and hard to get going. And of course, to be compensated for all your time and effort. Um, there are lots of resources on selling on Etsy. I know there's Skillshare classes on how to sell on Etsy. I'm sure you can find classes on YouTube on how to sell on Etsy. But truly what you're looking for is a sample. Uh, you need to have a, you need to go out to people and find out whether people actually want it. And you need to find the people that might want it. So uh, people often make the mistake of just asking, you know, their friends and family, would you buy this? How much would you pay for it? $20. Okay, so you start making it and selling it for $20. And then a couple of months down the road, you find out you're only making 50 cents an hour. Um, figure out how much materials are going into it. Figure out how much your time is going into it. And then you make your markup on that. And then um, just see if there's a price, there's a market out there for your stuff at your price point. There's different ways to go. Uh, you know, there's the Etsy market, there is local stores, there is uh, country um, markets and city markets that you can go to. Uh, they all have their pluses and minuses for doing it. It's, it's, um, there's many people that have done very well at it. I had a woman on the show, um, uh, Suzanne Paquette. Uh, we were talking about her. She came on for quilting, but she talked about how she made hats um, for a summer and then turned that into a business. And uh, so there's definitely doable. You just need to find where your customers are. Uh, John has made a comment, John from Art East about the patterns and the mis and possible mistakes or just confusion. As a pattern writer, I always welcome questions about my patterns. So don't be afraid to reach out to the designer. Good point, John. Thank you for saying that. Diane Fabic has asked, am I teaching or attending any quilt shows in the USA? No, I'm not. In fact, it's, um, hard for me to do that because I am not legally able to work in the USA. So um, I just don't, uh, there's all sorts of immigration issues. Um, if I was lecturing, I know there's workarounds and things like that, but um, I've just, I just have to be careful. I know a couple of Canadians that are doing it, but you find out that they have uh, dual citizenship or something like that. But uh, the US has become quite strict on those things. So um, no. I am not. Nina Reno has asked, how do you measure a quarter of an inch from the needle to the outside of the foot? Well, um, Nina, I have a video called how to sew straight and I explain, um, how to get that quarter of an inch. Uh, you, you have to test it is really what it comes down to. you you sew three pieces together, uh, of the same size with a quarter inch seam and then measure that inside piece and then adjust that accordingly. I use a ledge of masking tape just to mark the side of where the fabric should go. And uh, I still, I've been doing that method for I think seven years now. I still do it every time. And I still do tester pieces every time too um, because it's amazing how it moves and it's amazing how it's different with different fabric and different threads. Yeah. Maria Piazza has asked from, she's from Ajax, Ontario. Can I use more than one fabric for a one block wonder? So I don't have a picture here of a one block wonder, but it is a kaleidoscope of colors and it's done by taking the exact same piece of the print 
and just rotating it. So a one block wonder, one block wonder has six, stack and whack I think has eight, and or four or eight, eight. <laughs> Can you use more than one fabric? If the, yes, definitely you can use more than one fabric. Um, you wouldn't necessarily put more than one fabric within the individual hexagon ones, but you could incorporate two uh, somewhat similar fabrics. Um, I would take a couple for a test drive just to see whether they work together. But yeah, there's no problem using two different fabrics especially if they were from the same fabric line. Uh, so the colors are the same. They just got different patterns within them. Yeah, you could use more than one. Deb Rapp has asked, when's the next cruise? The next cruise is next April and it's the Panama Canal. Yeah, and I will have more information about that before the end of the month. Marg Q, the color class will be available for everyone or for the crew? Um, it's going to be for everyone. Um, and I believe the crew will get a discount. Yeah. Phyllis Palladino has asked, I saw on YouTube someone doing HSTs by doing strip piecing on the diagonal and cutting them out. Have you ever done it that way? I have a video on 10 different ways to make an HST and I think there's probably two more that I haven't put in there. But um, yes, that method is in there. So I had a teacher um, th that really liked that method. I find it very fiddly. Um, my favorite method is either doing the eight at a time or the two at a time method. But there's advantages for doing it both ways. So. It's up to you and uh, what the project is. So when you do the long strips, all your HSTs are exactly the same. So often that's not the way that we're making quilts. We, we need our HSTs to be different shapes and sizes, uh, different uh, sizes and different uh, color uh, variations. So I, I give the pluses and minuses to each one of the techniques in the video. So t check that video out. Everyone likes method number 10, the accordion method. Uh, that's really good when you want all your HSTs to be different. And for those who don't know what an HST is, I get this question all the time. I know um, we just presume everybody knows, but an HST is a half square triangle. And an HST block is just two of them put together. But often we call that an HST too, just to confuse all the beginners. Oh, I see somebody. Sarah Richard from France is here. <laughs> up very, very late. Thank you for showing up. Um, Wendy has asked, do you have any tips to align lining quilt tops and directional and linear lines and background so they don't get skewed? Um, that happens when you begin to lay them out. So I'm not sure if you've got a long arm or you're just talking about quilting on your domestic sewing machine. So she's talking about lining up the back with the front and making sure everything fits in properly. Um, it's tricky because those three layers like to move. So what you need to do is you need to, as you're gluing it or basting it out, make sure that you've got a major line in the back matching a major line in the front. And then I would baste it, um, not just using spray basting, but I would use actual basting stitches um, if that is super important to you. Um, it is an advanced technique. Those layers do like to move. Um, you may find if your back is not perfectly flat, you may find that you get bunching and puckering in the back as you tr as those spaces enclose, but um, you can give it a go. <laughs> you can give it a go. The worst that can happen is there'll be a pucker and life will go on. The quilt will still be warm. So just know that it's a lot easier just instead of matching horizontal and vertical lines is on the back, it's usually best just to choose one and let the other one float. Yeah. 
Barbara Weedrick has asked, how do I feel about hand eye quilts? Uh, hand eye quilts are lovely. They are, I see them all the time. They are just absolutely beautiful. They have a whole different flavor to them. Um, and if that's the way that you want to <laughs> make your quilt, go for it. Uh, I did uh, an interview with Laura from Make Modern. Um, and she, uh, she showed a denim quilt that she hand tied and there's lots of hand tied quilts out there, but I'm just showing if you're wanting to look at uh, one on one of my episodes, um, she had some pictures of a beautiful denim quilt and tying is so much better when you're using denim as well, because the layers are so heavy. Um, and it's quick and easy to do too. And, um, it lasts a lot longer than you think. And it's easily fixed if any of them come apart and you can play with them too. Like you can put little pom poms there. Um, you could put buttons there. There's just a lot of things that you can do with tied quilts. So yeah, tied quilts are beautiful. Okay. Tammy Richardson, I need to know how to bind a 45 degree angle. I did a table runner with a pointed end and can't figure this out. I'm sure I'm way overthinking it. Um, so very easy did a video about um, turning um, odd size edges on your quilt. I do not know the name of it other than it run something like that, bind any angle type of thing. And I think it's probably about a year old. She was binding an octagon, but she was showing the technique of hitting those angles. Um, the problem with a pointed star is that there's just a lot of fabric in that point. Like you're going to have um, on the corner of a quilt, you have, you know, not very much here, but you've got a lot on this side when you're doing a point like I had on the, those bunting um, triangles that I did, there is a lot of fabric in that, that point. So I know that you go, you still have to go to a quarter of an inch from the other edge. If that's the width of your, your um, that you're going with your binding, but you just have to tuck it in really nice and tight to get that perfect angle. And it's, it's not as difficult as you think. Just um, work on getting that fabric inside tucked in, not just the fabric on the outside, and it will come. Uh, Kay Glenna has asked, ideas beside rag quilts for someone who still isn't as experienced in the precise corners. Well, um, I mentioned at the beginning of this video, do Stash Buster number one or Stash Buster number five. Uh, five. They're both nice, easy, and very forgiving. Um, simple and I also did a video on 10 fast and easy quilting techniques and that's just part of it. You know, um, there's just, don't worry so much about those perfect corners and those precise corners. Uh, there's just, once you get into a quilt and once you get it quilted, so much is forgiven. I say this all the time. Um, I have a quilt on my bed. I've also said this a lot. <laughs> my very first sampler quilt. I mean, I don't think I hit any of those points and I put them together and I still, from f 10 steps away, um, it is still an absolutely beautiful, beautiful quilt. And you don't even see that the points aren't matching up. So just work on those bit, the tr the most important thing is that you're working steadily on those basic techniques. So work on your straight sewing, work on your straight cutting, work on a good ironing technique and those precise corners will come, but don't worry about them not being perfect until they do get there. Yeah. 
Brooke has asked, do I prefer hand binding or sewing machine binding? Or do you mix it up? A few people made you feel bad about only machine binding. I'm not good at hand stitches, stitching and you don't have the patience. I mix it up. I do it differently all the time. And I don't, in general, my general rule is I hand stitch quilts that I'm actually giving to someone I know. And then I uh, machine bind the other ones just in the interest of speed. However, that's not always true because I often like the color of that thread being part of the quilt. Um, and I do that when I machine bind. I sew it to the back and I machine bind on the front. And I just like that pop of color sometimes. Um, when I did the Carpenter Star one, I gave that to my father. But I did a nice contrast stitch on that top. Sometimes you do a zigzag. Sometimes you can use a fancier stitch. Um, and it depends. But that's in general. Those are my two, my two ways that I do it. And somebody made you feel shame. I mean... There are quilters that, out there that think that there's exclusive clubs or there's ranks to be in. Um, you know, some people think that if you don't quilt the whole quilt together, that you're just a piecer as opposed to a quilter. You know, don't worry about it. We're all quilters. Um, and you do what makes you happy. Uh, you're filling your bucket, not theirs. And if uh, the machine sewing that binding on is a fast and easy fit finish in a place where you're not happy or you, you're just not wanting to do the other stuff, that's fine. That's, that's for you. That's your method. Oh boy. <laughs> I see we have a, a spammer in the, uh, in the comments today. I wish they would, uh, understand that they're, they're in a quilting feed, you know, who's going to be wanting to, who wants the hot chicks <laughs> that has shown up for him. Uh, so I, I'm pretty sure Brandy has, uh, has blocked them, but they have a tendency to have a lot of different emails at their, um, disposal. Um, something that I'll mention because I got into a conversation with someone this month is, that in the comments, every so often, there is a person saying, Hi, Doris, I haven't heard you a while. Nice seeing you here. Or, boy, I really like that comment there. Do you want to chat some more? Anytime you get those comments, that is a spammer. There are different programs. I see them come, and they come in chunks. And I cannot eliminate them fast enough. I try my best but they, they just get into all nooks and crannies of uh, YouTube feeds. So if you see them, they are not real people, and you can report them as well as myself. So um, just do yourself that favor. Um, I think we have a, a chance for just two more here. Um, any tips for applicating a small piece, like an animal face that needs some detail? Try to applique or perhaps markers help. It's always a balance between um, when you're getting into those small shapes, how you want to do it. Luckily, there's lots of different techniques, right? So we can hand turned applique. Sometimes we piece it. Um, sometimes we can embroider it on. And when I say embroider, sometimes we can do that with a sewing machine. Sometimes we can do it by hand. Uh, you can also do raw edge applique. And as you mentioned, a marker, you can do that too. The only problems with markers is they have a tendency to fade, but if it's a children's quilt, it might not be around forever as well. It'll be well used and loved. So you just choose what works for you. Um, I wouldn't use a button um, just because it sounds like it's for a child and we all know the choking has it with buttons, but just do what makes sense for you. Um, one applique method, uh, if it's fast and it's for a child, I would probably just do raw edge applique and then just spin around it with some thread um, just to give it a little bit of texture. That's what I would do. And I think... I've got one more question from Tracy, and Tracy has asked, when making quilts for people, is there a perfect size? 
quilt to give? Unfortunately, there's not one answer that fits all, Tracy. Uh, and it's a balance. It's a balance between how much effort, time, and money you want to put into that quilt and what would be appreciated by them and what do they need. So, um, you know, if they are elderly and they're in assisted living, maybe a lap quilt would be the best choice. If they are going off to college, uh, then you may want to make that twin size quilt. If they are, you know, in another stage, um, you know, you maybe a, a picnic quilt or, um, or even a pillow might be the appropriate size of quilt to make. Again, it's a balance of, you know how long it takes to make a quilt. It takes weeks and sometimes months and sometimes years. So are you really wanting to invest all that time in one project? And the answer may be yes for a certain person, but it's not going to be yes for everybody. So just take that balance of, um, of who they are and, and those other factors of yourself. And um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, where is it? Let me just see. I think I've lost my, my thumbnails. My thumbnails, where did they go? Show in background, show in all scenes, no. Nope. Okay, let me just pull them up here and I'm gonna throw them on the screen here. So in case you didn't know, I made a video last week uh, called Summer Sewing, 10 Tips to Find the Time because it's hot outside, uh, hot inside and it's hot outside and uh, maybe this is not the time to do all the heavy stuff. Um, then I had an interview with Marianne LeCure um, and we were talking about decluttering our wardrobes and trying to get some style back into your life. That was really important for me. <laughs> and then um, our next YouTube Live is going to be on Tuesday, January, uh, July 7th. Hopefully people will be back from their uh, the long weekend. Uh, we have it one in Canada and you have one in the US and I'm not sure where everybody else will be in the world at that point. Um, but uh, that's when the next live will be. I wanna thank you everyone for showing up. I know you are all coming here from all over the world and I thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening. Oh, somebody here from Australia. What time is it there? It is nine, is it 10 o'clock in the morning there? I think so. And unfortunately I did not get, um, I'm just gonna quickly run through the, through the chat here to see if I recognize anybody else from the cruise. Oh boy, we had so much fun, but just so many laughs. It was just, um, it's a funny thing about um, when you arrive and you know people like to do the same thing you do. You've always got a place to start from and it, we just had a great time. Um, I see a lot of members from the quilt crew. Thank you very much. Uh, we had our gathering last uh last Sunday night. Unfortunately, it was, <laughs> that was our June meeting in July. So we'll have another one on the last Sunday of this month. And I hope to see you then. So thank you everyone for showing up tonight. I've said that again. I'm just so thankful for you all. Uh, even this, <laughs> forget about this, <laughs> the spammers there. Uh, you've all had this wonderful conversation in the, in the notes. And thank you so much for just being here. So take care and um, take care and I'll see you this coming week. Thank you.